to take you deeper than the challenges that are in your life so you understand exactly why Jesus is in you and why you are in Christ. Welcome to a dynamic and life transforming program impacting generations with the word of God. Christ has been made our wisdom. He's Christ, the wisdom and the power of God. He's not just the power without the wisdom and it cannot be complete to be wisdom without the power because the wisdom of God evokes the power of God on your life. Here is Fenero Make Manners with Apostle Grace Lubelli. Now, today, uh, I want to talk uh, about a very important aspect of faith. Of faith. And this follows a question that I hear common among believers. Why is it that I believe and I am delayed in my faith? Why is it that I believe and I find as though I have erred when I believed? Some are delayed in their faith. In other words, what they expect to come two weeks or four months or one year come study or 40 years later or four or five years later, what they expect to come in a week could come, you know, uh, 10 years later or even never come. Some error, and they say, you know, but I see like I erred, yet I set out myself to believe God. So why is it that I see errors? Why is it that I see like I have done a mistake? Or some see further damage on themselves in the process of faith. You see, a doctor tells this person, oh, take this medicine. The person says, no, I believe God, I'm healed. And this person heals. And another person again goes through the same issue, goes to the doctor, doctor tells this person, take this medicine. This person says, no, I believe. And then they die. And so why did they die? Well, some say, you know, you did not have faith. Oh, but the person in their own perspective, they feel that they applied faith or the principles that you have spoken about over the years. What's the problem? What am I missing? And I'm going to answer you today. There are three degrees or levels of faith. I want to emphasize that, at least for what God has revealed to me. There could be more, but for what God has revealed to me, that's what I have seen by God. There are three levels of faith, or three degrees of faith. The first degree of faith is in the knowledge of who God is and what he is able to do. That is important when we are teaching people about faith. You need, if you are in a class of faith, especially for a person who has never heard about God or has just received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, a babe in Christ, before you tell them to believe or teach them to believe, you need to teach them who God is and what he is able to do. They need to have a very clear idea of this infinite God. They must have a very clear revelation of who this God is and what he is able to do before they believe him to do it for them. Because you see, there are people in the world who believe God can heal, but it's a hard thing for them to believe that he can do it for them. You see that? They, they believe God can provide, but they, they know that God is a provider. They believe in his ability of provision, but... They don't believe that that is for them. However, they can confirm that it has happened in the lives of different individuals. You see that? But the first level of faith is knowing that God is. And the reward of them that diligently seek him. He, we teach, we must teach people to know who God is and what he is able to do. And then the second degree of faith then introduces us to the personal life of how much we individually are able to believe God. In that realm, we exercise and examine our faith, individual faith. We exercise and examine our faith. The Bible says, exercise yourself always unto godliness. The Bible says, examine yourselves whether you be in the faith. You see? Examine your faith. 
try yourself out whether you're really in the face. You see? Because if you do not approve yourself, then the Bible says you're going to head to being a reprobate. You see? In 2 Corinthians 13, the fifth verse, it says, except ye be reprobates. So, you, you learn to examine, you learn to exercise yourself individually to the God you know and his abilities. That's a second degree of faith. That's a time of testation and trial. And the third degree of faith is growing in the wisdom in your face. The wisdom in your face. Growing in wisdom in your face. And that's a very important aspect of faith. Because it's one thing for you to know what God is able to do, who he is and what he's able to do. It's another for you to exercise yourself or examine yourself against who God is and what he's able to do for yourself on whatever you're believing God for. But it's another to walk in wisdom in faith. In wisdom in faith. In 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the fourth verse, it says, when Paul is speaking about his ministry, he says, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. And I want you to underline that. It was not in enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of power. And the next line says that your faith Listen, your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You see that? That your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, stand in the wisdom of news. Because he, he, he likens the power, well, he reconciles the power of God with the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom of God is the power of God. And he continues the next verse in the sixth verse. He says, how be it we speak wisdom that wisdom of God, Sophia, among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught or nothing or are destroyed. But we speak the wisdom of God, he says, in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God has ordained before the world and to our glory, not to, and to our failure, not unto our survival, not unto our suffering, not unto our pain, not unto our death. The wisdom which is hidden in God is ordained before the world was for your glory. There is a wisdom that was provided by God before he even created the world because he saw you in the time you were in and he knew that had to come first before your existence or everything that you see. And he says, this was for your glory. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So we, you see, he has given us a picture and he says, it is possible to build your faith according to the wisdom of men. It's possible to build your faith according to the wisdom of men. But also, you are not called for that kind of faith. The believer is not called for that kind of faith. The believer is called for the God kind of faith established in the wisdom of God. So some of us are delayed because we are not working or functioning in the wisdom of God in our faith. Some of us are, have made mistakes even to destruction because when we apply faith, we are not in line or in tandem with God's wisdom. And so we're destroyed or we lose or we fail. And so this is what I want to emphasize. This is what I want to build my message on. Let me give you an example, a typical example. Now, the, the Bible says, now these three abide, okay? Faith, hope, and love. So the Bible says, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. What, what, does, what does wisdom teach you here? You see? Hope, faith, hope, and love. Faith, hope, and love. That's the order. And then it says, and the greatest of these is love or charity. You cannot express faith beyond your revelation of love 
or if you walk out of love in the demonstration of your faith, then you have lost the wisdom that must come with the demonstration of your faith. You see that? Because love is supreme. Love is supreme. There are places where in the wisdom of faith, for example, faith is to yourself. That certain things, although they work in your lives, they're not for the demonstration and expression or testimony of the public because that might stumble them which are younger. And I have seen believers who have done things in the name of faith that would stumble the rest of them. I'll give you an example, a story we had one, year, one time of a young man <laughs> me and somebody in this studio know him. The fellow said that for him, he blessed all the food he will ever eat on the earth. He has said, I prayed for all the food I'll ever eat on the earth. That's his face. <laughs> Can I doubt that the meals he will eat for the rest of his life are not consecrated? No, because he believes that he has blessed everything he'll ever eat. You see that? But that's to himself. And so he gets in public where people are all growing in their own ways of faith. And then the fellow says, you know, I, I think when you guys are praying for, your, for food, pray for yours. <laughs> Not my mere consecrated my food from the beginning of that day when the revelation hit me to the day I will die. So I don't pray again. <laughs> And he is true according to his personal faith. But one day he will get to a public place where he will stumble others. Because he, in the place where it's demanded to give thanks for those which understand it that way, they might not understand his faith. He says, do you have faith? He says, have it to yourself. You see? Because we see people, even Paul speaks about them, which judge a fellow who is eating because they are not eating. And then we see fellows which are judging he that is not eating because they are eating. This is why it becomes personal. Don't judge a person because they are not fasting. But again, don't judge somebody because they are fasting because you don't know where they are with their God. You see that? But I'm still emphasizing this issue that in love, Love would compel you because you don't want to lose these other ones out of your face. Then keep that specific face to yourself. When you are alone, just eat because you blessed all your food for the rest of your, your life. But there's somebody who's just gotten born again and they need to learn that when we are to eat, we give thanks. You see that? So you choose between losing that individual or the other. I'll give you another example, typical example. Oh, you say, oh, you went to the doctor one of those days, you're traveling, and then they, they, you saw a COVID test, and that test proved positive. But you believe that you're not sick because you've been told right. You see, you believe you're not sick because you've been, you're, and that's okay. And perhaps you don't even have the signs of that disease. Or perhaps you even have them, but you have refused to regard them because you believe for your healing. And you stick on in faith and act right and confess right. But because of wisdom, the fact that this document said positive, you have refused to regard him. That's okay because you are in your war of faith. You see that? You're in your war of faith and you're right. Fight your war because this is your faith. It can carry you through for healing. But the fact that your body could contract it, or if, even if you refuse it, but the fact that that paper has shown it, when you get to somebody who you know is healthy, I expect you to do something out of love and in wisdom. You see that? You distance yourself. With wisdom, you distance yourself. You don't need to confess you're sick. 
They can greet you and then you put your, bo- your, 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 your what? Your elbow. Whatever you can do. Why? Because you don't want somebody to suffer or catch something in the process of your face. Because if somebody says, no, me, I'm not sick. You go hugging everyone and kissing everyone on the cheek. And before you know that, three, four, five, five people are sick around you. And they don't have the faith you have. So you could survive and they could die. That's not wise. You see that? And everyone says, oh no, in the name of faith. In the name of faith. No. Faith requires wisdom. Faith requires wisdom. Somebody shout hallelujah. Hallelujah. But there's a deeper aspect I want to now go into that I believe has blessed me and I know will bless you in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Because sometimes we don't walk in wisdom in our faith, I have seen that our faith could be misdirected or perverted because of the ignorance of God's instruction. I want you to write that down. Sometimes our faith can be misdirected or perverted because of our ignorance of God's instruction. What did God say versus what did I understand in God's saying? And in struggling to interpret what God has said, I interpret it wrongly. And if I do, then my faith can be perverted. It can be corrupted. It can be misdirected. And because of that, I will not have the results of a faith that I so profess. Or if I should, then I'm going to be delayed until the instruction is clear. And when the instruction is clear, then the reality and manifestation of that miracle takes place. I'm going to give you a very fundamental example of our father Abraham. Now the story of this great man of God begins at a very old age and him and his wife do not have children. In Genesis the 15th chapter, the Lord comes and appears to this fellow. And says unto him in a vision, Abraham, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great, exceeding great reward. And Abraham said unto his God, what wilt thou give me, seeing that I go childless, and the steward of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And then he says, I don't have a seed. I don't have a seed. And lo, no one is born in my house is my heir. I don't have a seed. You see that? And no, and no, nobody born in my house is an heir. You see? What is Luke 8.11 saying? Luke 8.11 says that the parable is this, that the seed is the word of God. I have a sermon on that separately, and I'll teach about that very soon. You need to understand how the seed principle works. So I have no seed. And spiritually, he's he's seeking for a certain instruction to propel him to birth. You see that? And the Bible says, behold, the word of the Lord came unto him. Because he says, I don't have that seed. So the word of the Lord comes unto him saying, this shall not be thine heir, but he he that shall come forth out of thy own bowels shall be your heir. Whoever will come out of your own bowels, your own seed shall be your heir. And the fifth verse says, And he brought him forth abroad and then told him, Look up in the sky toward the heaven and tell the stars, for if you are able to number them, and he said unto him, So shall your seed be. Okay, And he believed on the Lord, the Bible says, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Did Abraham believe? Yes. And it was counted to him for righteousness. So he has believed God's word that he's going to have a child. He knew his problem was a seed and instruction to propel him to give birth. The seed says that out of your bowels, out of your own seed shall your heir come, not Eliezer or his own seed. He says, okay, he has received the word. Has he believed? He has believed. He has believed. He has believed. 
And God has counted him for righteousness, so he is in the rightness of God to believe. So we don't doubt that our father believed. But when he believes, he doesn't see the child. He has believed. The next result is supposed to see a child. And then traditions come through. You know, it's not yet the time, even though God has spoken. But they have nothing in scripture to prove that. You see that? So sometimes we make the word void of its power because of our traditions. He says, we err not knowing the scriptures or their word or the power of the scriptures. We err not knowing the word, know the power of the word of God. So, some will say, oh, you know, yes, God spoke to Abraham that he would have a child, but it was not yet time for him to have a child. What was the right time for him to have a child according to your revelation? What had you heard from God concerning Abraham and Sarah's destiny concerning children? That's all me I say. It's assumption based on our personal experiences sometimes, and then we choose to divert the word of God to provide for our indifference in faith. But that is not so. So Abraham remembers the words, and if you read Genesis, the whole 15th chapter, there is no mention of Sarai, his wife. There is no mention of Sarai, his wife. So in the 16th, of course, he goes back and tells Sarai, his wife, you know, God appeared to me and he said that I'm going to have children. The seed and instruction has been sent. He says, out of your own bowels shall a seed come. You see, it was very clear. Sarah not it. So I think they wait a bit. And then they don't see it. And Sarah says, you know, Abraham, God said out of your bowels, did he mention me? Did he mention me? I'm not mentioned in that conversation. He says, out of your bowels. So perhaps I have a problem, but God has spoken that you shall have a what? A seed. Or it's probably her saying, you know what? We know that God said you would have a child. Yes, we know that. But he has not necessarily said that it's in my womb. So, I ask you, go into my maid, Hagar, and get me a child. Get me a child. And I think Abraham in his own thought, hmm, come to think of it. If Sarah had not thought it, Perhaps Abraham could think it. Hmm. Besides, he said that I would have a, children out, a child out of my loins, but he didn't say who, with who, but he said I would. <laughs> and now Sarah is here telling me to go into what? Into Hagar. Abraham obeys. Lo and behold, the seed what? Comes. And again, because he does not understand God, he does not understand the instruction of God, the Bible tells us in Genesis, again, the 16th chapter, the 16th verse, he says, and Abraham was four score and six years when Hagar bare Ishmael unto him. But again, Abraham, yeah? when Hagar bore Ishmael unto him, it was 86 years. And from 86 years, from 86 years, 13 years, Abraham is convinced Ishmael is the heir. And God never spoke to him again. God never spoke to Abraham for another 13 years because he thinks in his mind that this should be the seed. This must be the fellow. It, 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 it cannot be any other. And God comes when the fellow is 99 years old. In Genesis 17, and appears to him again. When he's 99 years old, God comes and appears to him and tells him, Abraham, Abraham, I'm the almighty God. Walk before me and be perfect. Mm, okay. It's a conversation. Praise God. 
he continues to tell him of the covenant he will make with him between him and multiply him exceedingly and abraham the bible says fell on his face and the bible says god talked to him after 13 years for him is convinced and the next verse says and as for behold my covenant is with thee verse 4 and thou shalt be a father of many nations now the conversation of nations has come before it was just a seed in the sky and now God is elucidating, he's explaining deeply that this was more than just stars in the sky. I'm trying to build a great nation out of you, and nations out of you. Remember, when he is separated from Lot, and God tells him, look north, east, west, south, and, 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 and east, for as far as your eyes shall see, that I give unto thee, and thy seed forever, thy seed forever, thy seed, I want you to note that, forever. What does he see? What does he see? You see, I tell people, if God has said to Abraham that as far as your eyes shall see, I have given it to you and your seed forever, had he had children yet? That's Genesis 13. He complains in 15 that he has no child. So by the time God promises that I will give this unto you and your seed forever. That means there was a plan to have seed. But he didn't pick it. He didn't pick it. He didn't pick it. God spoke, but he did not what? Pick it. But he says, unto thy seed forever. He didn't pick it. You see? And now in 15, he comes and complains, oh, see, I'm going childless. And Eliezer, my servant, is going to take children for me to become heirs of my own property. But I, he spoke in 13 that this is unto your children. So I see that because of his barren condition with Sarah, when he walks in the spirit into the whole world, he sees the possession of a land, but he has not yet conceived his seed. You see that? He has not yet conceived that the lands God has given to him are for his seed. He becomes a father later, and I'm going to come to that later in 17, because when he walked by faith, he walked the whole world. And the whole world became an inheritance. But even though the world became an inheritance, he had still not yet gotten a revelation of what should come out of him. So in him complaining before God in 15, that's when God tells him, uh-uh, from your own bowels shall you have a child. 16, Sarah says, ah, I was not mentioned, but I'm sure that God will bless you. Go into my maid, and she has a child. And I've taught this before and said, for me, Sarah telling Abraham to go into Hagar was human effort to fulfill God's promise. And there are many believers in the world like that. God promised, and he said that I'm going to do this, and because you don't know how to interpret his instruction or you don't have enough faith because his instruction contradicts human wisdom, what do you do? You find a way that human wisdom would allow to fulfill the promise of God. And, 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 and that is typical. That sometimes we want to use, God said, I will bless you, yeah. But is he going to bless you with integrity? Or are you going to contradict and, and compromise into corruption because God said he will bless you? Like one man said, no legacy is as great as integrity. as a big one. Think about it. But back to the point. Are you going to apply human effort to get that job because God said that you'll have that job? And the easiest opportunity is human wisdom. Are you, yes, he said, none shall lack her mate, and you can claim the scripture, but are you going to go out of the order of the way husbands or wives come or even break the cord of common sense because it's agreeable with the wisdom of men? Some men, because you have to get married at any cost. You have to have children at any cost. And then you compromise and go into witchcraft because you must have a child. 
Besides, God said you'd have a child. Regardless, I'll make your ministry great. So does that mean that you have to manipulate some ways around that because God spoke and so you have to find a way to manipulate yourself in the wisdoms of this world? Besides, God spoke. You will give birth to an Ishmael. And if you will give birth to an Ishmael, you might not know its cost until the day you give birth to Isaac. And then you have a war. Huh? You have a war between that which God produced out of you because of he promised, because again he promised, he must fulfill. You could be delayed because you don't understand the instruction fully. You have not yet connected to his word yet. But it eventually comes to pass. His purposes are fulfilled. Regardless of how you delay them or how they're delayed, they always come to pass. So Ishmael will be there and Isaac will be there. And like the scripture says, Ishmael started scoffing and fighting and teasing and disturbing the spirit of Isaac. So that which you have begotten by your own human effort and wisdom will one day turn against that which you have begotten by God's promise because they are similar. They're both sons. And some of you in the literal world, you're confused between two men. You're confused between two jobs. You're confused between two ministries. You're confused between two careers. You're confused. You are confused between two or three. Or perhaps some of you did not only go into Hagar, in quotes, you went into others. And all of them look like their sons. And all of them look like they're the choice of heir. Now you're confused. But it was human effort. It was your own way of doing things. When God promises, stick to his way. I said stick to his way. Somebody shout hallelujah. But back to what I'm trying to emphasize. I don't want to lose this. So Sarah tells him, go into my mate. And he does. And then they have a what? A son. After 13 years of Abraham believing a lie, <laughs> God tells him, no. I will multiply in verse 3. If his face goes down and he says, um, God talked with him, verse 4, Genesis 17, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Verse 5, neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, for a father of nation I have met thee. For a father of nation I have met thee. And he says, and I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Now he says he has changed his name from Abram to Abraham. What does Abraham mean? Exalted father. What does Abraham mean? It means a father of many. You see? A father of what? Of many. So we see that in the naming of this fellow was the deliverance of this fellow, but also in the deliverance of this fellow was the naming of this fellow, the man of God, Abraham, father of multitudes. But if you go back to see from the wisdom of God and the things that are spoken of for, when he comes to you and he says that you shall be he tells, if he go, let's go in the verses before. If he comes to him and tells him, look up in the sky. For as the number of the stars is, so shall be your seed on the earth. What is he meaning? That you're going to father many. But Abraham still didn't get it. God needs to come to him 13 years after he had had Ishmael to tell him no. Perhaps let me help you in naming you what I already prophesied on you years ago. Because it's the same thing. Father of multitudes, Abraham, father of many. That's what I spoke to you when you first spoke to me in Genesis 15, that you don't have a seed. And I told you, look into the sky for as many as the stars you see, those children shall be your seed. If you had even gotten it earlier, when I told you for as far as your eyes can see, your seed shall possess forever. It should have been obvious to you that by the time your seed possesses the whole earth, it must multiply. 
But you didn't get it then? Let me call you Abraham, father of multitudes, or father of many. <laughs> and to show you that our father had not yet gotten this. 15th verse. And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt call her name Sarah. She shall not be called Sarai, but Sarah. And I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And Abraham, the Bible says, fell upon his face and laughed. You see, he laughed and said in his heart, shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old, and shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? You see? That means Abraham had not yet gotten it. <laughs> he had believed, but he had not connected to the wisdom of God's instruction. So he's laughing. How is that possible? Because I still could be believing it a bit when you're talking about me. Now you've also included. Now Sarah is in the conversation. <laughs> Mother Sarah is back. You see that? And her name also is changed from simply princess to a noble woman, which shall be a mother of many. You see that? Which shall be a mother of many. And this was when Sarah was 90 years old. But you see, as sad as this may be, they did not conceive. They didn't conceive. But it was clear to Abraham that Ishmael is not the heir, like you thought for those 13 years. That's whole delay. And you know, the Hebrew, the number 13 means rebellion. So sometimes our rebellion is not that we deliberately rebel, but sometimes our rebellion is because we have misunderstood or been perverted in the interpretation of the instruction of God. You see? So when our faith is perverted or misdirected because we have not correctly or rightly interpreted the instruction of God, we might, without deliberation or without deliberate conviction, rebel against God. You see, there was a rebellion on Abraham, not because he intended it, but because he did not know how to interpret what God has said. Remember, these things are written for, for your learning that through comfort and patience you might obtain hope. Now, we see God has had to impress it on his life and reiterate the promise by naming him and our mother Sarah. And for all of those 13 years, they have rebelled because they did not know how to interpret God's instruction. In fact, the number 14, which should be the year after that, is deliverance. See, so in the 13th year was rebellion. In the 14, number 14 represents deliverance. And we see that it's about a year after that that the real conception and idea of Sarah conceiving comes into conversation now. How? Again, in Genesis 18, God has to bring three people. He has to come and appear in three men. And Abraham sees them from afar, but he discerns that this is God. He has to bring them into their house. They cook for them a meal. He sits afar to watch them eat. And they speak the very words that God has been speaking since Genesis 13. <laughs> Your wife, Sarah, shall have a child in the time of life. And the Bible says when Sarah had it in her tent also, she laughed. <laughs> how many times has God repeated the same word? And how many years? It took them 13 years to get it. 14 years to the birth of Isaac. It finally sank. 
it was not long from those three men that Sarah truly conceived and gave birth to a child. So, is it so that God had planned it in his mind for Sarah to conceive for, for, after 14 years of the word given? Or more? No. The wisdom to connect to the faith that they had in the word or the instruction that they were given was missing. They did not know how to respond to the instruction that God had sent. So our patriarch was delayed. Our matriarch was delayed. Isaac was delayed. God has to even justify them through faith that that which loves in Abraham loves in Sarah and later they have a son called Isaac meaning he loves. He even in their own unbelief imputes righteousness that their laughter becomes their seed. Did you get it? And he gives them Isaac. But Isaac was delayed a hundred years 90 years, now the child comes. Yes, the promises of God have been fulfilled, but they have been delayed. Some of you, God spoke many years ago concerning your ministry. He spoke many years ago concerning your health. He spoke many years ago concerning your business. He spoke many years ago concerning your career. He spoke many years ago concerning your marriage. He spoke many years ago concerning your calling. He spoke many years ago concerning your children. He spoke many years ago. The, the Bible is available for you every day. And whatever he has spoken now is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His oracles have not changed and his truth abides fresh every day for any man to get a hold of it and walk with it and believe God. But you don't have the wisdom in your faith to connect and walk in the instruction that God has given you concerning your destiny. And for such, some of you have erred with Ishmael's. <laughs> You're fighting with Ishmael's. The Sarahs are fighting with Ishmael's. The Abrahams are confused with Ishmael. They don't know what to do with what they did in their own effort. Or some of you, perhaps you have not even had an Ishmael. You have had a spell of God's silence. He spoke and from the day you started seeking him concerning the things he spoke, he has never spoken back to you. God is quiet. You'll say, Pastor, God is quiet. I've prayed, I've fasted, I've believed him. I've done all these kinds of things, but God is quiet. I, I, don't, I don't seem to get him. Yes, he spoke about my marriage. He spoke about my children. He spoke about my, my ministry. He spoke about my career. He spoke about my dreams. He spoke about my visions. But he has, he's quiet. Maybe because he spoke enough but you did not have the wisdom to interpret what he was speaking. And because of that, you've lost 10, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. When I understood this, I learned to pray this way. I learned to pray that God give me the wisdom and the grace to fully interpret every instruction you have spoken concerning my destiny. Because with that, I know that I will be in tune with the Holy Spirit. I'll be in time with what you have spoken. I'll be accurate in my execution. I'll be aligned in my application. I shall not be delayed. And that is what God does. You know, sometimes we don't know how or what to ask. And sometimes the answer is in asking the right thing. Sometimes the answer is in knowing how to pray. The disciples ask Jesus, teach us how to pray. Because some of us don't have results because we don't know how to pray. 
we don't have the right way to pray, reveal to us. Now I've given you an answer. I've given you an answer right there. I want to pray with you right now. In studio, in your homes, I want you to talk to God concerning anything that has troubled you, your healing, your marriage, your children, your womb, your finances, your relationships outside uh, family, your dreams, your aspirations, whatever God has impressed on your life and you feel that it is delayed or that you feel it should have appeared but you have failed to connect to why even though you believe. Pray that God will give you the wisdom to interpret instruction right because faith is most attuned when we have the full understanding of God's instruction. Come and speak to God. Sharamando robo zaba kushara la lelelebo. Jaraba koshete brando bo sita laba. Come and raise your voice and pray. Sharamando robo zaba kote rebro zaramando robo zaba. Lord, I need thee. Show me choir. Oh. Come and speak to God. Sharaba bako shata brako tele boze le bosha. Rimando robuza kabrako tele le bosha. Come and speak to God. Lord, I need thee. Tell him, Lord, I need you, Lord. I shall have a little bit of a shabaka braco terebros alabaye, robo shakatama coprande, commando bros alabash rebrosta, jeki prando zabalalendo satala braco talamaye, do sharamando robo zalabe coprande, hozile kende jike braco tolobo. Rise bo santa, kare bo zalamando robo zabako shata la 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 bo sha, kobra zele bo shapa kaprando robo zabako shata raba, shaba ke pranda bo zobo kobra kate, o zire mo kobranda le le bo zile ma, o sakamante ke shitere pa, yeri kazore mando robo shere bo ko, hasari ma kobranda le le zee, o shaba kobra zele bo bo bo. Bronda rebo zike shika bakata Raba zobo ko shere mando robro zele ba Ko shaka prando zele bo Zima she brazala baya This is my prayer for you That may God give you wisdom May he give you grace To be able to interpret fully Whatever instruction has been laid in your destiny In your path of life I decree and I declare that for anybody at the sound of my voice who has been delayed, God by His grace is going to take you back. His Spirit will remind you that which you have forgotten. He's going to open your eyes to what you must fix. And I see a redemption of things. I see a restoration early. I see healing. I see deliverance. I see breakthrough. I see this is your 14th year. The number 14 representing deliverance. Sharibunda. I see that God is delivering you. In fact, 14 also means release. It's a time of your release. 
It's a time for the release of your finances, for the release of your ministry, for the release of your visions and dreams to be explored and, 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 and received of the world. I decree and I declare that God is going to do great things this year for you than all the years of your life combined. Has he not spoken to us that this is the year of the manifestation of divine power or strength? This is going to be a great year for you, I decree and I declare. In the name of Jesus, marriages are restored, businesses are restored, ministries are built in the name of Jesus Christ. Time is redeemed in the name of Jesus Christ. If you're sick in your body, receive your healing right now. Because it says by his stripes, ye were healed. It's a past tense. Get a hold of it and receive your healing in the mighty name of Jesus. That virus, that bacteria, that germ leaves your body in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. I thank God because I'm going to hear great testimonies concerning your life. And if you've never given your life to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's the best decision you could ever make. And he loves you. He shed his blood for you. And conditionally, he invites you. I cannot talk about tomorrow or next week. I don't know what's going to happen next week. But I can talk about today. That today is your day. Repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you. Because you shed your blood for my sins. And was raised for my glory. Tonight, I receive you as my Lord and Savior and born again. If you've made that prayer, go on Fenero.org slash salvation and sending your story. I just want to send you something to help you understand what it means to be born again. Or you can call us on plus 256-200-999-405. And those of you who have testimonies as well, go on Fenero.org slash testimonies and send in your testimonies. Or you can call us again on plus 256-200-999-405. I will be glad to hear from you very soon. See you on uh, Sunday in Jesus' mighty name. My one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need my one defense. This broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information about the great work of God, visit us on the web at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app today and enjoy sermons, daily devotionals, and timely updates. The Fenero app, available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. You may also email us at info at .org. Follow us on social media platforms on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Finero, make man.